what can you and I do to make a difference in the world? A lot of people do try to answer that question politically. Uh, they say that if you right, vote for the right person or the right party, that's going to solve all the world's problems. Uh, but as best I can tell, so far we have kind of a perfect record historically of that failing miserably, so I don't think that's the answer. Uh, my generation tends to be a little bit more cynical, I think. Uh, sometimes we think that maybe the answer lies with the perfect social programs or education or maybe the next great tech will somehow solve all of our problems. But, I mean, historically that's worked just about as well as the political answer. It doesn't work. Uh, so what can we do? Okay, I know what you're thinking, Jeffrey Coons. You know that the preacher is about to say that Jesus is the answer. And you're right. Uh, but what does that even mean for you and for me? Uh, what do we do with the world in which we live? And how does it change anything that we think that Jesus is the answer? Jesus was honest enough in Scripture, I think, to say that not everyone would follow him. And Scripture is honest enough, I think, to say that the world doesn't always work the way that we wish that the world would work. But when the world is broken, Scripture tells us exactly the sorts of things that we need to be doing. It's not crazy difficult. It's not crazy complicated. It's the fundamentals. And sometimes the fundamentals are the things that we need to come back to the most. What do you and I do? In this series, we're not going to take our cues from CNN and Fox. We're not going to take our cues from Facebook and Twitter. We're going to take our cues from Jesus about how we live life that makes a difference. How do we live to make a difference in a broken world? What do you think the number one thing the world needs me to do right now? I know. I know. Post a hip Dixon and complain about something. It's exactly what the world needs. No, that, that's not it. I mean, a lot of people have tried that recently. I don't know if you've seen it, but it hasn't exactly changed anything, I don't think. What does the world need? Well, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. <laughs> I guess that's a decent answer, isn't it? That's where I want to start this little series with. I know it's the obvious answer. I know it's the, the answer you'd expect me to give. But what the world does desperately need is for you and me to show them what love actually looks like. They need examples of love. They need proof that love can work, that it does work. That They need demonstration that people are willing to try. Frankly, what a lot of people really just need is to be loved. And when we are loved, it changes how we interact with everything else. Your job and my job is to listen to the commandment of Jesus. You remember when he was asked, what's the most important thing in the whole wide world? His answer was love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second commandment, which was like it, is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does the world need? Love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. That answer is good. But for the sake of our study today, I think we need to be a little more specific and a little bit more practical. After all, uh, who am I going to run into that doesn't just say, well, of course we should love? I mean, wh what does that look like next week? What do we do differently next week? The Bible gives a famous description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And the thing that I want you to remember about 1 Corinthians 13 is that it's written to a church in turmoil, and that turmoil looks an awful lot like the world in which we now live. Corinth was the sort of place where you'd find a little bit of everything. 1 Corinthians 1.10 tells us that the church has split up into different parties behind different leaders. Hmm. Picking your favorite leader, demonizing everyone who chooses a different one, and, and calling names. Does that sound vaguely familiar at all? Chapter 5 indicates a rise of flagrant immorality. Again, does that sound familiar to you? Chapter 6 tells us that they fought each other in the church so much that they were taking each other to court. Have you ever heard anyone gripe about how we live in a sue-happy world? This is like Ecclesiastes says, nothing new is under the sun. Chapter 7 says they were judging each other based on social status. I think there's even some racial undertones there. Chapter 12 talks about how the different members of the body received different levels of honor and dishonor, and that's problematic. I won't keep going because this sounds so familiar, you can't miss it. It's against this backdrop, backdrop of junk that Paul has to nudge them. Here's how much love matters. Here's what love does. So I want you to pause the video for just a moment. And I want you to think about that backdrop and this backdrop, the one in which you and I live, 2020 and all its craziness. 
And I want you to read Paul's instructions to the church at Corinth about the necessity of love and the definition of love. And I want you to reflect on what you hear and how you think it applies to your world. Once you're done with that, resume the video and we'll continue our discussion. Now that you've read 1 Corinthians 13, I want to go back with you to verses 4 through the first half of verse 8. That's kind of the meat of the definition. Those first three or four verses were kind of the necessity of love, right? It doesn't matter what you have. If you don't have love, it's worthless. It doesn't matter how much you go to church. It doesn't matter how much you give. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how rich you are. Love matters most. It lines up with what Jesus says. Verses 4 and following are helpful to us because they tell us what love looks like. And that's where this lesson gets practical for us. And I want to read those verses to you uh, from Eugene Peterson's message paraphrase. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, keeps going to the end, love never dies. I have four questions for you. And this is the bulk of our study together today. Question one, what part of the love definition causes you the most trouble? Which one of these descriptive terms do you fail in the most? Is it the patient thing? Is it the kind of giggling when something bad happens to someone you don't like thing? Is it the self-centered thing? I know this is a personal question, but what part of love's definition is the hardest for you? Question number two, it's the same question, but instead of you, I want you to think about our society. Which part of love does our culture misunderstand the most? Which part does culture miss the most? Number three, this one might be harder for you than the first two, but what part of love's definition are you the strongest in? I hope your group has somebody who's close to you in it because they might give you some insight into you uh, that would be harder for you to see yourself. Question number four. This is the really hard one. Think of this coming week. What are you going to do differently because the world needs love and Jesus commanded you to love? Now again, preaching about love to me is one of the hardest things that I do because everybody sits here and nods and says, well, of course we should love. Who doesn't agree with that idea? But what does it actually look like in your life this week? What's going to be different? Use those first questions to help you. How specifically might you be tempted not to love? Remember, there's both a positive and a negative side to this stuff. Love is not doing some things. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the law could force, could not force uh, the white man to love him, but it could force him not to lynch him, and that was pretty important. Maybe love means there are some things that you need to stop doing. But that's not the only definition of love. Part of the definition of love is that there are some things we need to start doing. Love isn't just about what it doesn't do. Love is made powerful about what it causes a person to do. So I want you to look at both sides of that equation when you answer that question. After you discuss, and I want you to spend some time here, we'll come back together and I'll share a prayer and a brief word of encouragement. I hope you have an idea, a specific, concrete, practical idea of how you are going to work to develop love in your life this week. 
Maybe you envisioned a scenario where you tend not to act too lovingly. Maybe you are one of us who becomes a keyboard warrior when you see someone who you disagree with. Maybe it has to do with the way you drive. Maybe it has to do with your spouse or that person at work who is so irritating that you would kind of enjoy watching them fall down a flight of stairs. But wait, scripture says you don't rejoice when bad stuff happens to other people. Maybe that's it for you. I hope that you have chosen a really concrete way to work on being more loving this week, to do the things that... I'm not asking you just to change your thinking or your feeling. This, this question, this request I'm making of you is to change your acting. So if you didn't do that, pause again and go back, but I'm just going to keep right on going because I'm going to assume that you got this sort of thing right. I hope you have identified one specific thing that you're going to do differently next week. Maybe you need to start doing the dishes. I hope your plan worked and I hope you share your plan with your work, your group. Now here's the kicker. I want someone in your group to write down what you just said you would do. And when you get together next week, I want that person to hold you all accountable. This person just became your least favorite person in the group. When you come back at the beginning of our next session next week, I want them to ask you, how did you do on your plan to do X or not to do Y? I want to make this real. I want to encourage you. You see, Bible study that doesn't actually come out in our lives is pointless. That's what the book of James says. People can look into the law of liberty and not be changed, and it's just a waste of everybody's time. I don't want you to waste your time. I want Scripture to change you. So use your group to your advantage. Remind each other of what you're planning on doing. In fact, in a couple days, text somebody and say, how's it going on this, so that you have something to talk about next week. It's too late to change your answer now to try to find something easier. Let me close with one scripture and one prayer. 1 John chapter 3.16. It's the other John 3.16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. There's your challenge. It's what the world needs. Let's close with a prayer of confession that was written a few centuries ago, and I'd like to share it with you as we end today. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen.